It might sound like science fiction, but neurofeedback indeed offers the possibility to regulate your brain activity. But how exactly is this possible? In this video, we want to give you a quick idea of what neurofeedback is, how it works, and how a therapy or training would look like with the help of an example. The activity of our brain is associated with how we think, feel, and perform. Neurofeedback offers a mean to observe our brain activity and control it to eventually enhance our thinking or even reduce clinical symptoms. Let's start with the basics of neuronal communication. The basic unit of communication in the brain is the neuron. Neuronal communication occurs at an electrochemical level, just like action potentials. When many neurons that are similarly spatially oriented fire together, electrical fields are generated. They can then be measured on the outside of the skull with an electroencephalograph, also known as EEG. The brain has billions of neurons with trillions of connections. So when these neurons communicate, they start a cycle to excite the adjacent neurons. These rhythmic activities form distinct brain oscillations or brain waves at the cortical level, which can be picked up by the EEG. Those brain waves differ in frequencies, which is the speed of the wave, and it consists of units of hertz, which refers to the number of cycles per second. It also differs in power, which is the amount of energy. Brain waves are associated with perception and cognitive performance, and their deterioration is correlated with different diseases and behavioral states. For example, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or short ADHD, is characterized by abnormal activity with an excess of so-called tonic theta and a lack of beta activity at rest. The idea here is, if we manage to change those cortical activities, we can enhance the functions of the brain and thereby improve behavioral outcomes or reduce clinical symptoms. In ADHD, this would require reducing excessive theta activity, for instance. Neurofeedback is a non-invasive way of influencing these cortical activities, which requires the active participation of the learner, in contrast to other ways of manipulating brain activity using passive neural stimulation approaches, such as transcranial magnetic or electrical stimulation, or psychopharmacology. There are three major fields of neurofeedback. It can be used as a therapeutic tool for peak performance training or as an experimental method. In this video, we will focus on the application of neurofeedback as a therapeutic tool on the basis of an ADHD example. Neurofeedback as a system consists of several processing steps, namely data acquisition, online data pre-processing, online feature extraction, online feedback generation, and the learner him or herself. In the following, we will talk about each of them in turn. All starts with choosing a method for data acquisition. Several ones are available, and for this video, we chose EEG. The second stage is online data pre-processing. In this stage, EEG recordings are processed in order to detect and be able to filter out so-called artifacts, which include eye or muscle movements. These are activities in which we are not specifically interested, but which will destroy relevant brainwave recordings. We would like participants to modulate their brain activity, not their eye or muscle movements. Next, in the feature extraction stage, we use computer algorithms to select and transform specific features from the EEG recordings that are relevant for our neurofeedback intervention. Successful extraction is the cornerstone of accurate data interpretation. In our ADHD example, we would extract the theta and beta waves, but not gamma or alpha. During online feedback generation, the extracted signal is being converted into a sensory stimulus that is shown to participants. This can take the form of simple sounds. What results is the so-called feedback signal, which is actually an indicator of how active the targeted cognitive function is. One option is to display feedback continuously, so the participant can adjust his or her behavior in real time. Similar to operant conditioning, the idea is that participants learn to modulate their brain activity in response to the presented feedback. The last brick in the neurofeedback system is the learner him or herself. Learner-specific aspects like mood, motivation, or perceived task difficulty all play a role in the effectiveness of neurofeedback. What is more, it has been found that 30% of people seem not to respond to neurofeedback at all, which means that neurofeedback does not train them to self-control their brain activity. Current research is looking for reasons why this is the case. Overall, the learner actually plays a crucial active role in the neurofeedback system, which might appear very technical at first. Therefore, individual characteristics that could influence performance need to be considered carefully before neurofeedback is applied. Also, while the whole neurofeedback system might appear very strict and inflexible, all of the stages we just described are not set in stone, but they represent starting points for designing a personalized cognitive training that can be applied in many different contexts. 
Single sessions usually last around 20 to 40 minutes and can be adjusted depending on the participant's ability to focus. Past studies have used visual, auditory, tactile or mixed modality signals to give participants feedback on the level of the cognitive function they want to modulate. For example, visual stimuli that have previously been used to provide neurofeedback for changing brain activity can take many forms, including rectangles changing color saturation or size, the simple bar changing its length, animated hands changing posture from a close to an open grasp, or even flying rockets. Neurofeedback can be applied to both children and adults and is not limited to alleviating ADHD symptoms, but is also thought to be beneficial in treating various disorders, including eating disorders, addictions, mood disorders, anxiety, learning disabilities, Down syndrome, or even neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Nonetheless, caution must be taken in mistaking neurofeedback for a universal remedy. Let's take the ADHD example again. Sometimes studies don't use a control group at all, which means that we don't know if a child improved after neurofeedback because of the training or because of simple developmental factors not related to the neurofeedback. And often these studies assess ADHD outcomes that are rated by assessors who are not blinded, for instance by parents or teachers who knew if a child actually received neurofeedback training or not. This neglects factors such as expectancy effects and as a result hinders the evaluation of treatment effectiveness. There are other factors that must be taken into account, such as the random assignment of participants to the experimental and active control groups, or testing if the brain waves and focus are indeed changing through the use of neurofeedback. Before this happens, we don't know how effective such interventions actually are.